slides, but I forgot the, the quantum class. Uh, all right, well, welcome back to 837. Uh, let's see, I feel like I haven't seen you guys in a long time. But I don't, I don't know why I'm not here. Anyway, uh, let's see here. So in terms of announcements and stuff, pretty much the normal stuff. Uh, your homework is due last Thursday. Our coming homework is due this coming Wednesday. So we're back to the normal cycle. Right, and this this home, uh, not this not the Wednesday in two days, but the, tomorrow, but the one next week. Right. Uh, yeah, so this is the homework to implement a ray tracer. Just out of curiosity, how many of us have gotten started with that? A few. That's good. Yeah, I, th I think this was kind of rewarding. It's, it's a fun assignment to play with uh, and, and implement all kinds of cool visual effects. And I see a lot of students extend this assignment for their their final project. Uh, beyond that, I was just taking a look. Your midterm is in about. Two and a half weeks, I think, on the 15th. So, you know, you can't say you weren't warned because I've warned you just about every single lecture. Uh, uh, and, and other than that, the one kind of hiccup in scheduling of this class, other than uh, the, the first assignment, which apparently scared away a lot of you guys because it was a little shorter, uh, is that the, the midterm and a check in for the final project are due at the same time. Consider yourselves warned now. The final project, little, all, all I'm asking for is basically a short proposal, like a paragraph or two, telling us what it is that you're going to do for your final project. So it's not that big of an onus, but it does just to make the timing of this course work out, those two new things coincide. So if you don't want them to coincide, then pretend like the deadline for your, your project proposal is a week sooner. Yeah? Problem solved. Okay, so, so anyway, it, that's, uh, I don't, I, you know, no, no complaining to you about that, because it really is just a paragraph or two. It's just the way. Thank you. Any uh, any procedural questions before we get started for the day? Cool. All right. So uh, today we're going to keep talking about rendering. Surprise. Uh, you're, you know, you're, you're in the graphics class, so that's the thing that we do. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, we spent the last several lectures uh, developing the theory for, for, for taking a ray and finding the first thing that it runs into in a scene. Right? And essentially, uh, you know, if, if you think about the last couple lectures, first we find the ray tracing algorithm, right, which is just this basic uh, technique of sending a ray through every pixel of your computer screen. And then we extend it in various ways like to add shadows and soft shadow and focus and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, all of our scenes looked really boring, right? Like, what, what are we able to render so far? Uh, really flat, kind of terracotta looking shapes with uh, you know, an inversion uh, rendering uh, law that we all know and love. Remember that inversion shading is cosine between the normal to your surface and the angle to the light. We're going to see that in just a minute. Um, but of course, most of the surfaces in, in everyday life uh, don't act like Lambertian ones. Actually, most of the ones in this classroom kind of do. Uh, <laughs> looking around, right? I mean, because we happen to have this weird paneling on the wall. But, but uh, 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 typically they don't. <laughs> and uh, certainly many surfaces are, are reflective and brushed and, and isotropic and, and all these different crazy materials that we see around us. And, and a big part of the graphics pipeline and, and where our computation goes uh, is into very careful uh, capturing of those materials. Uh, so today, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, material properties of things that are kind of, I would argue, like either metallic or flat, um, but basically are opaque objects, uh, right? So the basic assumption we're gonna make for now is that all of the light energy that comes in at a point on the surface either gets absorbed into the surface at that point or bounces back up. So uh, one thing that we want to talk about is an effect called subsurface scattering. Right? So that would be important, uh, for example, for rendering marble uh, and skin. Right? Uh, so if you've ever done this experiment, I call it experiment, but I consider it more like a probably trick or you, you hold like a flashlight up to your hand and you can like see all the inner workings of your hand. Obviously what's going on there is not the shading models that we're talking about here, right? Because I pointed a light straight into the surface of my skin and somehow it's going through the interior of my hand and out to my eye, right? So there's not just like a single bounce happening there. Um, so what we're going to defer on that for now and talk about it a bit in some future lectures. Um, as you can imagine, that's extremely compu computationally expensive uh, relative to the ray tracing kind of model, right? Because the ray tracing model really wants to follow one ray. But what would be that really in some sort of scattering is, is a little fishy, right? I'm using the word scattering for one. Yeah. Um, but it's incredibly important. So if you render marble, uh, for example, marble will look really terrible if you don't have uh, some sort of scattering. The other place where it's important is for humans. Um, so, you know, there's this effect called the Uncanny Valley, 
uh, which we'll talk about a tiny, tiny bit by the end of this course. Uh, right, the Uncanny Valley is this idea that actually as you make animated characters look more and more human-like, eventually your brain actually rejects them more. It's really annoying as graphics people because your options are make really cute cartoony things or have this extremely expensive rendering pipeline and there's no happy middle ground, right? Because the middle ground is like somehow in our brains registers as like dragging a dead body around. Um, and one of the kind of important uh, features, it turns out, for overcoming uh, this is, is subsurface scattering, but the, the people really are, are tuned for whatever reason to notice that uh, your skin is, is typically shaded in very soft mesh. So anyway, this is a very long-winded way of saying these are all things we're not going to cover but, uh, uh, today. Uh, but today we're going to cover just simple surfaces so you can have um, this, this nice kind of Andy Warhol uh, teapot image that we see on the screen here. Yeah, so that's, that's where we'll start. So letting a material appearance is probably one of the most classical topics in the computer graphics world and, and really goes back as early as uh, graphics history itself. And, it, and it's absolutely critical for realistic rendering. I mean, you can put all of the time and effort you want into the ray tracing algorithm, um, but at the end of the day, what you do with the rays is actually decide on a color for your pixel. And, and, and this is really where uh, physics, computer science, and um, a lot of hand wiping all, all come together uh, into one uh, giant mess. Uh, and, and, and really the complexity of these, these material appearance systems varies extremely widely, right? I mean, today we'll talk about some basic rules that you can essentially implement by just typing formulas into your, your ray tracer that are more complicated than the dot product. But as you can imagine, uh, you know, they, they vary in complexity all the way from that on one end of the scale to like actually setting up a system to capture, you know, the reflectance of a particular uh, material on the other. And in fact, uh, people in graphics will really do this, right? There are all these um, uh, uh, techniques for, for capturing the reflectance model of different uh, uh, materials in the world. And, and oftentimes, people will build up a swatch of these things uh, as they, they engineer their, their, their graphic system. Yeah, and so some of the different appearance things that we can think of include the intensity, shape of, of highlights, glossiness of your surface, the color. Color is actually kind of an interesting one because we render in RGB, but of course the world isn't actually RGB, right? That's just the sensors in your eye that, that are red, green, blue sensitive. So already we've, we've made an approximation there. Um, and, and also things like, like spatial variation and texture, right? And these show up in all kinds of cool things. And I encourage you to, you know, as you walk out of the classroom today, like just start looking around at all the crazy materials that are in our everyday life that we don't think about. Um, everything from like satiny texture, you know, satiny material which has some specular component and some shininess and they're soft. Um, blonde hair is another interesting one where if you look really closely, you'll see that like most of the material models that we talk about today have one lobe of reflection, right? That's kind of one bright spot here. Um, certain types of hair have two, uh, and that has to do with total uh, internal reflection along the internal parts of the hair. Uh, and, and capturing that for, for that species of hair, or whatever the term is, uh, is, is quite important, especially if you're rendering things for frozen. I like the way you guys are looking around. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any event, um, these are all effects that people put quite a bit of thinking into, uh, uh, and, and really matter for, for getting your seeds to look like. Um, one thing that we're not going to be terribly formal about in this class, which is good because I am not a physicist, in fact, I basically flunked out of a physics major in college, and, and here I am in computer science. Uh, it, 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 it's this uh, question of radiometry, right? So one of the kind of interesting applications of ray tracing is absolutely true um, that ray tracing algorithms don't just get used for like 3D animation. They also get used in designing solar panels and studying the effect of sunlight on your crops and all of these sorts of things. I mean, it's exactly the same rays, right? <laughs> it's just rays of light. Um, but if you write software uh, in that world, you have to actually do physics. <laughs> like you can't just you know kind of eyeball it and, 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 and see that it's okay. Uh, and so in that world, radiometry really matters, right? Understanding about like well, some things are, are, are radiance per, per solid area, and some things are power and intensity and flux and so on. Um, in this class, we're going to largely do this qualitatively. Like, we observe that surfaces have lobes that look like this when they reflect, and hence we engineer our reflections function to imitate that. And the reality is that that's not so far off from the early uh, graphics methods. Of course, the more recent ones uh, get totally physical and, and try to understand every last uh, detail. In fact, some of my favorite, favorite research comes out of Cornell, where they actually take different materials and put them in a flatbed scanner. And, 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 and use that as sort of a, 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 a what is it, a reflectometer, like a way to capture reflectance. 
uh, and or, or even um, I think for a while Kavita Bala was putting materials in a CT scan so she could get the internal structure of the little micro things that happen inside of a piece of felt uh, just right to render. But that's probably overkill if you have a you know, video game. Uh, and another thing that we're going to be really sloppy about, although it, almost universally in graphic systems you are, unless there's really a reason not to be, uh, is color. Um, so today we're going to be living in kind of a grayscale black and white world. We're going to talk a lot about sort of the energy of light, how it's reflected off of something, um, but we're not going to talk about the fact that most of what we'll sketch out is really a function of wavelength. And we know that, right? I mean, certain surfaces, you know, we have some white light with some spectrum that hits the blackboard here, and what comes out is some other color. Um, and, and, and really, it's not just like this is some lenticular RGB lens, right? This, this thing has a very particular frequency response. And, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later in this class, but, but in, in graphic systems, typically that's ignored, right? Because at the end of the day, when you store an image, you just store RGB channels. And that's because that's exactly what your eye is associated to. Okay. Um, what that means basically is that every operation that we'll talk about as one operation really gets repeated three times, right? One for, for each channel. But this is an approximation. I think it's important to note all of the sloppy things that we do in this class uh, before, before we get too far. Uh, and, and as one additional thing we're going to talk about is, is mostly just uh, point light sources. Um, a standard thing to do, which is not all that far from, from accurate, is to say if I have two lights, um, and I look at the reflectance <coughs> off of the surface due to those two lights, then essentially I take the reflected color of one guy and add it to the reflected color of another. This kind of makes sense, right? This is this idea of superposition, that if I add you know, two amounts of energy, they kind of bounce off in an independent fashion. There are materials for which that is not true. Right? Obviously, maybe there's some materials that maybe I exceed some capacity for it to be able to absorb energy, and then it just starts reflecting off more than it did before. Um, but those are not typically the materials that we render in everyday life. But again, if you're working in a physics laboratory and your job is to write a ray tracer to simulate a nuclear reaction, or I have no idea whether nuclear reactions have anything to do with rays, rays or not, uh, uh, then, then you might reconsider uh, these things. Uh, and similarly, uh, we're going to assume linearity here. That if I make my light two times as bright, then the reflected color is two times as bright as well. These are approximations, and they're really, really easy to get wrong. Right? And, and, and so, for instance, um, one of my proudest uh, uh, bug fixes at Pixar uh, is the fact that uh, you can get colors that are bigger than one by doing this very easily. You see that? Like if I, if I add a bunch of lights to a scene and I render it and I just add up all of the stuff that's reflected off of a point to render it, eventually, you know, my pixel value is maybe between 0 and 255, but I'm just adding stuff and I'm not paying attention. It's very easy to overflow that number. Um, and, and this can cause a great source of bugs uh, for, for your ray tracing. Right, because somehow you're getting colors that are brighter than what your monitor can display in a sense. Uh, and, and, and this is, this is okay, so let's uh, let's talk about light. So first of all, uh, so far, uh, and in fact, if you started your ray tracing, tracing assignment, this is probably true. Um, what have we done to to figure out how to light a surface? Well, effectively, you know, a, a, a ray bounces into your surface. You draw one vector back to the light source, another vector, you know, normal to your surface, you take the dot product, and, and, and then you multiply it by the color of the light, maybe, and, and that's the, the color that's reflected off of your surface. And already that's physically kind of weird. Do you see that? That in particular, let's say I have a point light, conveniently there's one shining right into my eyeballs every time I try to teach this class. Uh, and let's say that I walk farther and farther away from that light. But like in a way that's like just perpendicular to that line that I draw out of the light. Does, does the color change at all? No, right? Like if, uh, if I'm just using this dot product rule, then I can move far away as I want, and there's no distance term in there. It's just a dot product, so, so essentially uh, the color remains the same. If you think from like an energy conservation perspective, does that make any sense? I can, I can, I mean, the farther away, the more stuff I can fit that, that can see the, the, the light bulb. No, right? I mean, the farther away I move from the light, the more the energy from that point should be kind of distributed about a whole sphere, right? And so, in fact, the very first thing that you can do to make your ray tracer a little bit better is to have one over r squared fall off for your, your point light source, right? Uh, and this is going to be an easy thing to, to add to your ray tracer, of course, right? The basic idea is that a point light, if you think of it as completely isotropic, meaning that it just distributes energy completely evenly within the ball around the, the, the point light, 
Remember the, the, the surface area of a sphere looks like R squared, not like R cubed. I always fall for that. Um, then essentially if you want to distribute your energy evenly with the radius of the sphere, then the farther you go out, you need to multiply by a factor of 1 over R squared to, to account for that surface area. There are a lot of different problems with this. I mean, one is if I get too far away, then everything is just really dimly lit. But the more important one is if I'm like right up in the light's business, then, then, then it can get arbitrarily shiny when I do that. Yeah? And, and, and of course, physically that doesn't make any sense, right? So at some point you get so close to your light bulb, like your hand would light on fire, and then it's physical all here. Um, and so, so typically uh, what people do is they say, well, it falls off like one over R squared, maybe add a linear term and some constants and things just to kind of mollify it a little bit. Again, this is our first instance of something that is not physical at all, but we just don't want to divide by zero in our graphic system, and this is a reasonable way to do it. Do you see that? Um, okay. Does this 1 over r squared fall off make sense? This, I think you will implement in your home too. It's like a line of code. That makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Right. And so, so essentially, um, right, so that's the first term. If I'm trying to figure out how much light comes off of the surface, the first one is to figure out how much light reaches the surface, right, just like based on distance. The other is, to, if you think about light like a vector, right, so, you know, if you think of it like an airplane that's about to crash into the ground here, this is probably a poor analogy, um, then, uh, right, the very typical thing to do is to take vectors and kind of decompose them into the sum of one term that's parallel to the surface and one term that's perpendicular, right, and, and if you think about the, the, the term that's, that's parallel to the surface, does that get absorbed into the surface? No, it just, it's just kind of grazing right off. Right? And so if, if you want to know the amount of light energy that really hits into the surface, and in a sense has to be processed by the physical system that's sitting here, right? that's, that's not equal to just 1 over r squared times the intensity of the light, but rather 1 over r squared times the intensity of the light times the dot product between this angle here. That makes sense because that is the, the component of this vector which is hitting straight into the surface. So that's like the incoming irradiance is, is this uh, term. Right? This is called the cosine theta. I don't know if it's called that or not, but it's called that. So. That makes sense. And, and remember that cosine is maximized when theta is zero. Yeah? And it's minimized when theta is 90 degrees. So it kind of makes sense, right? So if light is like coming straight in, then I get, I'm, I'm, I, I get lit. And if I turn 90 degrees, then I don't get lit at all, right? Because the lights just go right past. Okay, so, uh, right, if we combine all this stuff together, then we have um, a formula uh, that I've shown you here on the top of the slide, uh, which is essentially saying the amount of light that, that actually gets into the surface and gets reflected back out, um, or at least gets either absorbed or reflected or whatever else, is equal to the intensity of the light times cosine of the theta that accounts for this angle change times 1 over r squared. Yeah? Um, and, and so this is the formula for, for incoming uh, irradiance. That makes sense to everybody? I think it's pretty straightforward so far. And in a sense, this is explaining um, um, the Lambertian rule, right? The Lambertian rule is saying that that's the amount of light that comes in, and that in Lambert's law, that just that energy just gets scattered off totally uniformly. OK. So we can, of course, model lots of different types of light. And, and, and many of these are really easy to code. And the more or less what you guys would guess uh, they look like. So for instance, um, you, you know, if I want to model directional light, so roughly the sun is like this, at least from our perspective. right? Because the sun, roughly all the rays, by the time they get to like a square mile radius around uh, MIT here, all the rays are moving kind of parallel. Right? Uh, and so um, in this particular case, maybe there's not a 1 over r squared term, and maybe the theta is, doesn't really depend on where you are on the surface, but just there's just some constant vector that points toward the sun um, throughout your whole scene. Um, if you play, I would encourage you guys to download Maya, or, or like one of these rendering tools, and kind of set up a scene and put in the lights and see. And, and, and you'll see that essentially they have this little menu of different lights you can add. And they're just like different light bulbs you can buy, right? There's a point light, which is kind of like a little Christmas light. Um, there's, there's a directional light, which would be kind of like a sheet. Of, of, of light that's sitting there. And really, that's how they render it, like a little square. Uh, and then uh, one additional uh, important one, if we're going to make you know animated movies, uh, is is a spotlight. Um, and this is, is is pretty straightforward, right? And this is all just modeling, right? So typically, in a spotlight, you're given a location of a light, a direction, and then two angles, right? So the idea here is that uh, you know the spotlight is sort of there's two cones coming out of the spotlight, right? The internal one where inside of that cone, it just behaves like a point of light. 
and then there's kind of drop off as I move in this little light yellow area, uh, and out here there's just no light at all. Does that make some sense? So the, the, the basic idea is that there's some hot spot where there's no attenuation. Right? Attenuation means taking light and decreasing it, and then you attenuate here to zero, and then and then it goes. How do you think artists design this? Using splines. Yeah, they can't, you can't escape this stuff. Um, right, so the idea is you have a spline where maybe here is one, here is zero, and it's some function of radius that shows the drop off of light as you, as you go up, right? Um, I imagine it would be challenging to actually design a light bulb given one of those splines that has that effect. But actually, I don't know, I have to think about it. Uh, right, so here's, uh, here's the, the, the basic look here we've added a plane downstairs so that you can kind of see what goes on, right? So here, um, what would that spline look like? Well, effectively, um, you know, here's maybe one, you know, and then we have these two radii. So here you can see that 100% of the light goes there. In this case, you can see a, a ring in the middle, right? So I guess their spline is more of a discontinuous thing. That makes sense. So it's pretty easy to, to, to figure out a, a spot. <coughs> So at the end of the day, what do all these things give you, whether it's a spotlight or an area light or a point light, they give you a way to distribute light throughout your scene. And now, uh, the hissing of the surface, you evaluate your cosine law, and now you finally know how much energy goes in, and your job is to figure out how much stuff comes out. Right? And, and, and that's really where we'll, we'll, we'll spend most of our focus today. Uh, and in particular, there's a mouthful that, that is the common uh, phrase that we use in the computer graphics world to describe for every incoming and outgoing angle how much energy gets bounced out. You guys, anybody happen to know what this, this term is? Really, nobody's playing with Maya or anything? It's called a BRDF. It stands for, let me see if I get it right, bidirectional reflectance distribution function. It's easier to get it right when it's right in front of you. Uh, and, and, and the basic idea is that, in general, when, it, when a surface gets lit, there, there's, there's sort of two things that matter, right? There's the, the vector to the light, and there's the vector to your eyeball, and, and uh, for every pair of those, there might be a different amount of energy that gets bounced out. Right, so, so and on, as, and as a, an example of two extremes, um, for a Lambertian surface, the vector to your eyeball doesn't matter at all, right? It's just, the surface just gets lit based on the energy that comes in. And now think about the reflection rule that, that, that Ed covered in his class. That would be kind of like a delta function, right? 100% of the energy that comes in this way goes out that way, and 0% goes anywhere else. Yeah, so these are kind of two extremes. Um, so in general, the BRDF is this kind of distribution over a sphere telling me exactly where all the light energy goes uh, when it comes in. And essentially, we can view rendering as one giant integral of this thing against the light coming into the surface. Um, one question you might ask is sort of, if I think of my BRDF, yeah, I can think of it as like some function, right, which takes in, you, you know, the, the, the light direction and the viewer and tells me how much, like some fraction of light that gets reflected from one to the other. And one question you might ask is roughly like, if I think about this function f, it's a function of how many variables? Any ideas? How many variables do I need to specify the direction to the light? I'm going to choose to interpret Dotun's uh, hand gesture as the correct answer, which is two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like the, the nod that happened there. <laughs> uh, 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 which is to say that, remember, a point on the unit sphere, you can, you can determine with two angles, right, spherical angles. And so you can think about this like a direction on the unit sphere toward the viewer, and another direction on the unit sphere toward the light bulb, and so there's two uh, total. Yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, the function was something like this. Like I put a little sphere around the normal vector to my surface, and I have two spherical angles that, that determine these two uh, things, and the BRDF uh, is some function f sub r that takes in these two angles and outputs, uh, or four angles rather, and outputs a fraction. And so then at the end of the day, what does the, the rendering equation do? Well, you can kind of think about it like it takes the integral over all the incoming light directions of the amount of incoming light times f evaluated at that angle 
where these two numbers are fixed when they point toward the viewer. Yeah? This equation is called the rendering equation, unsurprising. Yeah? Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a different way of, of writing it down, which I think is more typical, where you, you would just have two vectors, uh, which are the direction of the light to the viewer. Here, you might think that these are 3D, but they're really 2D, right? Because the 3D modulo of the, the unit length is, I don't care how far, like the surface doesn't know how far you are away from it. Any, any questions about the, the basic uh, definition of the BRDF? It's the fraction of light, you know, the fraction of the amount of stuff that comes in at this angle that goes out at that angle. That's what it's saying. Okay. And one additional thing to note, um, as a function on the unit sphere, typically we align it to the normal, to the surface. Right? Um, this is a little bit tricky. I mean, we're going to keep drawing these pictures as if the normal were up. But the reality is that some annoying computation has to happen in your actual ray tracer to account for the fact that your surface oriented relative to the light of the camera is like any arbitrary direction. Right? So a little bit of trigonometry that has to happen. Um, oftentimes, it doesn't matter. Like for Lambertian shading, for instance, like just take that product and don't worry about it. Um, but for instance, for certain brushed metals, this matters quite a bit. Where I'll have, so like kitchen appliances often have this kind of look to them, especially if they're trendy, right? So a kitchen appliance, what they'll do is they take, you know, this piece of steel wool and they'll take a shiny piece of metal and then they'll scrape it. But they scrape it in a consistent fashion, right? And so I, I, how many of you guys know this material that I'm talking about? It's like a piece of metal, but it kind of has these brush marks that go in one particular direction. Yeah, so in one direction, the surface is kind of diffuse looking, and in the other direction, it's kind of reflective looking. And so if you think about it, uh, for a material like that, the BRDF, actually the alignment and the tangent direction matters a lot, right? Because it actually needs to be aligned to the direction where they brushed it. And so it's going to be quite important to figure out how to align this sphere to the surface, right? Uh, so for instance, if, if, you, if you like geometry problems, uh, one typical thing to do would be like, let's say I have, you know, I make the Stanford bunny out of brushed metal. But the, the Stanford bunny's not flat, right? So when I brush in, there's some vector field along the bunny, which is describing the motion of my brushing. And then what I have to do is align my BRDF to that different vector at every point. Uh, and both designing that vector field and then kind of keeping it, book, doing the bookkeeping that you need to get this rendering to work out is, is interesting, uh, if, you, if you like. Okay. Uh, right, so at the end of the day, if you want to figure out the amount of light uh, that goes out, um, um, it looks like this, right? I take I in, remember that's that cosine rule. So this takes the, 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 the light vector and, and maybe the intensity of the light and so on, right? One over R squared. And then I attenuate is the vocabulary word by the BRDF. And that's the I hat. Is this physical the way that I've described it? Like, have we talked about like energy, energy conservation, Noda's law, any of that kind of stuff? No. There's some reasonable proxy for, for that, right? Essentially all it's saying is that there's some unknown function that tells me how much stuff comes out, given how much stuff goes in. Right? That's really the intuition. Um, it turns out physically this is not terribly inaccurate, and really the physics of light plays out uh, this way, but, but deriving it carefully is, is tricky. But in any event, if we, if, if we plug in here, of course, we're just going to keep composing together to perform this today. Uh, you can see that the, the, really this is what your ray tracer has to implement. And it's really no more complicated coding-wise than what you would have without this, right? Essentially, it's just some black box, S of R, which takes in two vectors and gives back a fraction. And you just take your old cosine law and multiply it by this, and the amazing thing are all the cool lighting effects that you can get just by, by evaluating a function. Hopefully now you guys can see why this doesn't deal with subsurface scattering. Right? Because with subsurface scattering, the amount of light that comes out here depends on the amount of light that came in over here, right? That's a weird model. Whereas here, the amount of light that comes out at a point has, has to only be a function of the amount of light that came in. Anybody have a guess for the acronym we're going to use when we talk about subsurface scattering? It's the BSSRDF. Uh, <laughs> essentially, it's a BRDF where you have an additional two inputs, which are the incoming point and the outcome. Right, so a typical way to visualize BRDF uh, is, is shown here. Um, I find these diagrams extremely hard to interpret, but if you're in the rendering world, you spend a lot of your time looking at this stuff. So let me try my best to explain what's going on here. So the idea is that this is a four-dimensional function, so I can't really draw it in 3D. Um, but the best I can do is fix an incoming light direction. And now it's, now it's just a function over the unit sphere, saying where everything goes. 
Yeah? And so the typical way to uh, kind of visualize what a BRDF is doing is to say, I'm going to draw a vector toward the incoming light. And now I'm going to show as a height map over the sphere where this energy gets distributed. Do you see that? So in this case, how should you interpret this? And notice that the normal of the surface is up. So one thing we can't really draw this into. Um, but what, the way to read this is that this surface is mostly reflective, right? Because you can see that this is the, the, the reflected ray direction R. But instead of like the ref reflection rule that you guys have already talked about in class, which would take this and just have this one giant point right here, which is 100% of the energy, there's some drop off, right? So this would be like um, a piece of plastic, right? So it's, it's, it's shiny, it's definitely specular, but like it's not like a mirror. I can't see the other side of the surface and it scatters the light a little bit. Yep, in fact, I think that material is shown in this teapot. Incidentally, you can see the materials we're going to talk about today are like super exciting. They're, they're still, they're not that version, right? They have this little shiny piece here, um, uh, but they're not like, I don't know, some ridiculously cool material. Um, but this, this, this thing can get you fairly far. So does everybody understand how to read these diagrams? Yes, Rose? Um, can you provide more intuition behind interpreting like the blob in the center? Like sure. The blob? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So, so, so Rose's question here um, is, there's two interesting features, and I only talked about one, right? One is this lobe over here. Lobe is a word you'll hear thrown around a lot in rendering world. All right, and this is saying most of this incoming energy is just distributed this way. But then uh, 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 Rose has a key eye here, and, and notice that it's not zero in the other directions. Yeah? Uh, and you can actually see that in this diagram here, because take a look at like this part of the, the teapot. It's not light blue, and it's not white. It's also not black, right? And so what's going on here is that there's some piece of this energy which is just getting distributed in like a Lambertian fashion, and then there's another piece that's getting reflected up. Uh, and this is a pretty typical scenario, right, that you have one kind of cosine law and then another shiny thing. Uh, and this is true for most materials that you see in everyday life. Like if you look at this projector here, you can see that there's some, some specular component. Right? You can see the, the shiny part of the light bulb, but also the projector just has a color which is just kind of generically reflecting the light that you see. Yeah, that's a great catch. Any other questions? Yeah. If you're wondering, how do people do this in practice? What do you think? It's just designed it by hand, right? I mean, you can essentially, if I give you this visualization, you could draw whatever crazy function you want. Right? So for instance, you could put two lobes, maybe you have a, a weird halfway <laughs> reflection or something like that. Whatever, you can, you can come up with all kinds of crazy material. Yeah. In fact, a really fun thing to do, um, which some people study, is I draw one of these functions, and now your job as a material scientist is to come up with a material that has that BRDF. Um, and this is sort of the inverse version of this stuff. Uh, if you like that stuff, I encourage you to talk to my colleague Stephanie, who does that kind of 3D printing stuff problem. Uh, but in any event, for our, our purposes, the, the BRDF is some function. And it's pretty reasonable to just visualize a slice, um, because for most, but not all, BRDFs, they have this sort of property that, like, let's say that I took this vector L, and I rotated it about the normal, what do you think would happen to this plot? It would just kind of rotate with it, right? This would be the idea of, of isotropy, right? That essentially the surface reflects light uh, evenly. It's just a function of the incoming outcome, right? That brushed metal thing, that would not be the case, right? So here maybe would be the direction of the brush, and if I shine the light in here, maybe it would look just like a sphere and get bounced out everywhere. Yeah? Hope you guys are getting ahead of the game here. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and that's this idea between uh, isotropic and anisotropic materials. Um, so actually, here's a good example of brushed metal. So there's an interesting feature right at the center of this tire here, which is this point. And this point is not, I mean, if you just made like a uniform piece of clay, you wouldn't see a singular point like that. What's gone on is that somebody has brushed this tire in a circular fashion. And so right at the center uh, it, it, it is a kind of interesting uh, location. So this has nothing to do with the new model and everything to do with how it's, how it's shaded. Does that make sense? And this is this uh, idea of, of microgeometry, or oriented microgeometry, if you want to sound fancy, you can throw it on that term at a uh, cocktail party. Uh, and the basic idea here is that we're rendering this, uh, this tire, probably this is like one giant quadratic patch here, like it's not, you know, a little itty bitty facets. But the reality of, of, of material is that it's rough, right? Like this, this blackboard is a great example. Right, if I asked you guys to make a 3D model of a blackboard, I think most of you could. You would give me back a square. 
but the reality is, if I took a microscope to this thing, it's probably actually a pretty interesting surface, right? There are all these little itty bitty facets uh, that compose the piece of rock or, or material, whatever the heck goes into blackboards, uh, uh, at a micro scale. Right? And so there are two different ways that I could capture that when I render, right? One would be to make a ridiculously dense triangle mesh with one triangle for every little micro facet inside of the, the, the material. Um, but the other thing people do is they say, well, the microstructure of this material, whether it's a brush metal or hair or fur or cloth velvet, they all have similar kind of properties, um, is, is, is notice the, that, in effect, changes the BRDF of the surface, even if I like, took a microscope to it, what I would see is lots of little itty bitty simpler BRDFs. That makes sense? Um, right. So, uh, there's a fun question, which is how to obtain a BRDF. If you're a builder type here at MIT, this would be a fun course project, although I can never convince anybody to do it. Uh, uh, so, so there's a, a particular device, which has been around, I believe, since before computers, called the Gonio Reflectometer. And it's exactly what it looks like. Right? I mean, it's just like, this is not the world's most exciting device. Essentially, you have um, you know, some arc on which you can place your light source, and then you have an arm, you have an arm that reaches under the table, right? so this controls kind of the angle of the, the, the sensor, um, as well as uh, pivots like a, like a record player. So this way you can get around both of the spherical angles. Uh, and uh, uh, right. then you, you position your service, you position your light source, and then you measure uh, the reflectance that comes in. And some poor grad student can sit there and take every pair of uh, light source and, and reflectance uh, detector uh, at angles, and out comes a bunch of samples from BRDS. Uh, and this is really what you have to do to, to obtain them, right? Like here's a, actually a, a, a photograph of a slightly different experimental setup. So I have an isotropic BRDF, one thing I can do is maybe like dip a sphere in the material that I care about, right? And then, uh, you know, maybe I, I have a fixed camera, and then I have like a moving light source around the sphere, so I light it from a bunch of different directions and take a photo a bunch of times. So what this gives me is sort of at a bunch of different theta samples, the value of the uh, uh, BRDF. Yeah? So in general, are most like BRDFs that like just, they're not very like functions, they're always like a bunch of samples that are different? It's a good question. Yeah, so the question is like, you know, you know the reality of, are, are the BRDFs that, that we see in, in Brennan's uh, Sample. Um, the answer is no. Um, the, the reality of, of is that most of the render material you see, what they do is maybe they do experiments like this to verify some theoretical model that they think fits it, and then they use the theoretical model. Um, that's beginning to change. That's one of many things that in the, this era of machine learning uh, is beginning to be revisited. Right. So there are actually some really interesting scientists that are like collecting big databases of BRDS, for instance. Uh, and then trying to ask questions like, can I do machine learning on this and, and learn what a reasonable BRDF is, or, or actually manufacture one uh, in a particular way. Yeah. Um, some of this work actually comes from MIT, from my colleague, uh, Fredo Duran, uh, who's kind of a guy. Yeah. So this is, this is uh, uh, kind of right on the, the forefront. Although actually, in terms of, of kind of data science, uh, BRDFs have always been right at the intersection of statistics and computer graphics, which is not one that you might think about a whole lot. Um, so in fact, actually, some of the really early work on, on BODS include these little databases, uh, swatches, and then what people would do would be interpolate them in different ways to, to manufacture new material. The reality is that the interesting BRDS are not just functions of, of, of the in and out vector, but rather they vary along a surface. And capturing that becomes extremely complicated, right? And so the, the, the really challenging statistical questions are like, how can I model the spatial variation of a BRDF along a surface in a way that I can uh, manufacture? And there's some really cool stuff. Uh, yeah. If you're interested, there's a little fun papers I can send you guys that do these kind of things. Right. Um, but if you do measure a BRDF from, from real data, um, then maybe you, you, you tabulate it, but at the end of the day, you only give a few uh, samples. So then all these parametric models that we'll talk about, like, like the inversion shading or, or uh, you know, different cosine shading that we'll talk about in a minute. Or essentially just ways to fit your data. Right? Like I could fit a spline to this information or I could fit some other law. Um, a pretty typical thing to do is to take a physical law and then maybe fit some of the parameters of the physics to the data that you have. Right, so maybe there's like some physical property of my surface I can't really measure. 
But I do know that my you know, reflected looks like cosine multiplied by some constant that's a function of the material. I don't know enough about the material to actually just know the constant, but I can measure it a few times in that case. Um, of course, the reality is in the artistic side of things, we don't really care if, if there's really a physical material that has the look that we want. Um, so often you'll see all these kinds of vague terms like shininess and anisotropy and so on that are intended to guide these processes, but maybe aren't, um, uh, you know, don't, don't come from actual experience. There are all kinds of different problems. Right, so diffuse shading is like uh, We'll talk about blind falling and of torrents. I encourage you to dig around a little bit on Wikipedia. You'll see like arbitrarily crazy formulas for, for these BRDS to try to capture all kinds of cool effects. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's talk about a few. So the one that I think we've done to death in this class so far is ideal diffuse reflectance. The BRDF for this is constant. Let me repeat. The BRDF of a Lambertian surface is a constant over the unit sphere. It is not cosine. Why is that? Because the BRDF is the fraction of the, the incoming light energy. But that's where the cosine happens. It's the, the cosine is the incoming light energy. Right? So the BRDF is just saying that 100% of that gets reflected back out. Right? Um, yeah. uh, so, right. so, so materials that, that tend to have nice diffuse BRDFs so are things like chalk and clay. Like, if you look at this whiteboard, it's probably approximately lamp version if I had it. based on like physical stuff, like how your eye works. Like in reality, you should be taking an, inter like an integral over the spectrum of light, but since you can't see it anyway, uh, we can just approximate it by, by, by three multiplies. Yep. Uh, but anyway, I'll get off my, my eye works. So essentially, uh, at the end of the day, um, this is the simplest beard you have, and it's just three numbers for, for red, green, and blue uh, reflection. Yep. Of course, remember, you have to multiply those by the red, green, and blue components of your light bulb to, to get the final color. It makes sense, right? If I shine a red light on a green surface, then I, I actually, it's just black. Yeah? Um, I don't know, this is just like, definitely wrong, but like, um, since light, like the color is just based on like the frequency, mm -hmm. wouldn't dealing with light and just like the super frequency be actually less computation in terms of like dealing with like the values? Well, remember that frequency is a whole spectrum worth of value, right? It's actually a function of over a wavelength. Around the three different values you need infinity, which is a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm not sure that's true, uh, but there are different approximations people. 
use there. So if you really want like butterfly wings, like these kind of radio, rainbow or radiance style images where, where, where wavelength begins to matter, then this kind of rendering algorithm is going to do it for you. Yeah. We're, going to we're going to defer a little bit until we're, we're going to spend a lecture outlining with my extremely poor physiological knowledge how your eye works. Uh, and then maybe we'll, we'll return to the question back. OK, uh, right, so at the end of the day, here's your formula for ideal diffuse reflectance. It's very straightforward. I take the dot product between the normal and the light direction. I multiply it diffuse. Notice I've done one additional thing here, which is I've taken the match between that dot product and zero. What happens when that dot product is negative? It effectively means the light is behind me, which means I don't, I don't get lit when that happens. Right? The light has to point toward me for that to happen. Uh, and, 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 and so that's, that's what that's happening. Um, that's a common source of bugs in people's ray chasing codes, is having a negative number come out of that dot product, and negative light is probably not a thing that any of us wants to experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. And this is this idea of lighting below uh, a surface. And just in general, we're going to be a little sloppy in this lecture, but anytime you see dot product, you should just clamp it at zero when it, when it has to do with lighting. Because really, that dot product is, is measuring this cosine law, and when stuff is behind you, it just shouldn't, shouldn't get it. Okay. Right, so on the opposite extreme, of course, we have ideal specular reflectance, which we also talked about a few lectures ago. Remember that this is completely view dependent, right? So in other words, if I, I look at a surface, I have this angle coming in, I reflect by exactly the same angle coming out around the, the normal, um, and, and that's the color that I see. This is the rule that governs how mirrors work. I don't know where we found this clip right here. Uh, but in any event, uh, right, the, the, the basic idea is that um, these are extremely polished materials, right? If you, if you do a little bit of recap, of course, um, this is the, the, the picture that goes on, right? Which is that there's the theta toward the light, the theta that are reflected, and those are the two same things. So what does the BRDF of this thing look like? Right, so the BRDF of, of a light virtual surface is just a constant. This is sort of the opposite of that, right? What it's saying is that like 100% of the light coming in from here goes out there. So it's like a really, 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 really pointy thing, yeah? In fact, it's so pointy uh, that the language of, of math that you learn in calculus class can't really account for it, right? This is called a direct delta distribution. And it's like a function which is infinitely tall and infinitely skinny, right? So in other words, 100% of this stuff all comes out of one point, yeah? If, if that sentence in part for you, that's okay. If you took probability class, you've probably seen that somewhere. Uh, but in any event, um, this is not a particularly physical model, right? I mean, it's impossible to get a perfectly shiny surface and, and, and expect it to behave well. Although occasionally these things do show up, right? So for instance, yet another weird application of, of ray tracing comes in. Um, if you look in the interior of cars' headlights, it turns out that the shapes of the interiors of headlights are very carefully designed for obvious reasons, right? Like you like a very particular distribution of light to come out of your car um, to make sure that you see pedestrians on the side of the street and where you see the car in front of you and that you don't like blind the guy in front of you but at the same time you need some sort of sufficient fraction of light energy. Uh, and so uh, one thing people do is, is really basically use the ideal specular view of the earth because it really is a mirror um, and then optimize the shape of that to get just the, 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 the light distribution. Um, of course, in reality, uh, our reflectors probably look something uh, closer to what we see on the right-hand side, right? and, and these are, are known as non-ideal reflectors. Uh, and essentially, they're just like that delta, that, that, that function we saw before. Right? They have, you know, if this is my incoming light, then my outgoing light, rather than just having one big pointy arrow, is, is kind of like a low that drops out. Yeah, and we'll see some examples of functions that look like that. Uh, well, right now, yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, this sort of empirical reasoning. This is why I always struggle to <laughs> read these BRDF uh, images. This is actually a distribution over a sphere. It's just that the low corresponding to the reflection is so much larger than that little constant piece we had before. It looks like a pointy shape. Right? So this is saying uh, you know, that the, this energy gets bounced off this way. If this were an ideal reflector, the width of this balloon would be very small. Does that make sense? And so a non-ideal reflector the width of the balloon gets wider, meaning that even for angles that are a little bit off of the reflected ray, there's still some light energy that uh, comes out. And this is what makes what we call a glossy material. Right? So a different way of visualizing that is shown here. 
so of course well, what we need to do is is, is, is is actually work out a model for that and, and one of the most popular ones is called Fong shading. Um, Fong shading is easy because at the end of the day it's just some formula you type in. Uh, it looks something like as, uh, as follows. Uh, right, so what we do is we compute a bunch of different angles now. Right, so one thing we'll call theta, uh, you know, the angle between the normal uh, and the reflected ray. So this is just the normal thing that you already, we already talked about when we talked about reflection in class. Oh, well, and Ed talks about reflection. But now we're going to compute a new angle, which is the angle between the vector to the camera and the, the reflected ray. Do you guys see what's going on here? So like, you know, the camera is down here. Obviously, if, if these two guys coincide, that corresponds to, you know, this a perfect mirror. But as Alpha gets bigger, now uh, less like it's reflected than us. Right? That's this idea of the area. Okay. So, uh, in the Fong specular model, what do they do? They, they look at, remember that, that we like cosine as a function, right? Because cosine is a big when an angle is zero and it drops off as it goes to 90 degrees. So, um, well, one thing we could do is throw cosine of alpha into our shading model as, as a reasonable way to shade it. And uh, uh, here's a, 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 the formula that Fong proposed. Is this physical? No. Fong just said, I want something that drops off with, uh, with, with alpha. So cosine does that. So let's use that. Right? And that's what the Fong model is. And then he said, well, I want to be able to control how quickly it drops off. Right? Remember that cosine is between, in this case, 0 and 1. Right? We clamp at 0. What do we know about the high power of a number between 0 and 1? It's small, right? And similarly, if I take the square root of a number between zero and one, it kind of gets bigger, right? So I think about cosine. You know, remember the only piece of cosine that we really care about is between minus pi over two and pi over two. It looks something like that, right? So if I have cosine squared, it's going to look something like that. And if I have the square root of cosine, it's something like that, right? So the Fong model, essentially, what is this parameter Q controlling? It's controlling the width of that specular, specular highlight. Right, so the bigger, let's see, the larger Q is, the more kind of pointy this cosine is, and the more sharp that, 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 that the highlight becomes. Does that make sense? So notice what, what happened here. This is just purely phenomenological. They said, like, we want a specular lobe, we want it to drop off, and we want some way to control it. So the way to control it is, is, is uh, this Q parameter, the way to make it drop off is by taking cosine of alpha. No physics needed at all. Yeah? Um, and actually, uh, it, it's, it's fairly convincing, and it's really the basic thing that everybody uses in rendering. Here's an example of, of, of all these uh, different cosines. You can see when Q equals 1, right, the, the red curve here, it's like cosine. When Q is bigger, it gets pointier. When Q is smaller, it becomes more like that. Uh, and this little piece here is called the specular lobe, and in particular this little shape that, that gets reflected off, it's called a lobe. So the Fong model for shading is sort of the sum of three things. It's ideal diffuse reflection plus a specular reflection plus ambient light. So what is ambient light? Do you guys have any idea? This is continuing in our, our hack. Here's the basic idea. Even if I covered up all the windows in this room and I turned off all the lights, it probably wouldn't be 100% dark, right? There's just some photons kind of chilling. You know, maybe they snuck under the window, maybe like my phone is producing a tiny bit, you know, whatever, no? And so the idea of, of, of ambient light is that it's a light color that there's no cosine law for, there's no source for, it's just a constant I add to everything. And this is an extremely common uh, thing to do in the graphics pipeline. The idea being that when I render a shape, the bottom of it is very typically not black. It's like kind of, it still has a tiny bit of light, right? And, and, and that's what we would call the ambient color. Um, and and the, the fancy phrase for this is that it reflects the indirect illumination, right? So maybe like the light that came off the floor and bounced onto the bottom of the table uh, and so on, right? And this is like a very basic way to make the scene look a little brighter. Like something you'll notice in your ray tracing when you start to implement it is that everything will look very dark. And the reason for that is that you're only accounting for kind of the primary bounces of light. Right? You're not accounting for like the light bounces off the floor against the wall, right? And so the way that we account for that is just add a generic amount of light to everything. Um, and, and it's actually a pretty reasonable thing to 
So at the end of the day, uh, that leads to the following uh, for, for the Fong illumination model, um, which uh, has this formula here. Right? So here is the, the Lambertian term. Right? Here is the uh, uh, specular term. And over here is the ambient term. And of course, if you control those, uh, you, know, you can get different kind of blocky shapes. Does everybody understand the, the Fong model here? Is the Fong model a PRDF? Think carefully now. What happens if I turn off the lights? Things still are lit. <laughs> Would that make sense for BRDF? Remember, the BRDF is the fraction of light that gets reflected out. <coughs> no, right? Because the BRDF is a fraction of light that gets reflected off of the surface. But somehow in the Fong model, a surface actually is kind of emitting light in a funny way. Right? That's not physical at all. So it's actually not quite a BRDF. This, the terms two and three here are, but because I added the ambient term, actually uh, uh, it, this is not even energy conserving, right? Like every, it's essentially the assumption it's making is that every object in the world actually emits a tiny bit of light. And, 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 and ignoring my camera teacher's philosophies about physics aside, um, this really is a, is a physical and classical model. Uh, and indeed, uh, 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 you really can't describe this using a, a BRDF. Um, that said, uh, this actually is the standard thing people do for rendering, uh, and, and it creates kind of rendered shapes that I think you've probably all seen in bad video games. Right? A lot of these kind of glossy but still opaque looking materials that, um, that we see uh, rendered. Right? So remember that Q coefficient? Now you can see effectively uh, how it controls what, what the surface looks like. Right? As Q increases, that little specular piece through the light bulb gets uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, pointy. All right, any questions about a uh, Fong model? I think it's pretty straightforward. Yep, so in your, your ray tracer, I believe you'll implement Fong, and of course, at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward, right? It just involves typing this thing instead of that product. Uh, yeah. Um, of course, there are all kinds of visual effects that are captured. Um, one of the kind of cool ones, uh, which actually is not so bad to model if you don't do physics and you just guess at it, but if you really want to get it correct, it's, it's extremely challenging to do the physics on the back of your envelope. It's called Fresnel uh, reflection. So this is this idea that for a lot of surfaces, as you view them at just a grazing angle, like I look just along the horizon, then suddenly the surface looks more reflective than it did before. So for instance, here um, is a uh, the SIGGRAPH proceedings for the, for the Middle Ages, and I'm looking at it in one of those like fake plastic tables, kind of this material here. Right? And so if I look down at it, it looks pretty diffuse. Right? But then as I get right up against it, like kind of like looking at the surface like that, eventually actually you can see the reflection of stuff coming off of it. This is the Fresnel effect. Right? And so one way to understand that in this BRDF plot here is if I kind of took my incoming light source as like here, and then here, and then here, right? What happens to the lobe? Well, for one thing, of course, remember the lobe is always reflected off, so it goes the other way, right? But the lobe here doesn't just rotate, it also gets taller, and that's this, uh, this uh, Fresnel effect. And, and, and most PRDS do try to account for this, it's an easy way to make your, your, your rendering more believable. Uh, and so, uh, for instance, one um, variation of Fong due to lit and torrents uh, tries to account for this by using a halfway uh, vector. So here, um, they define this, this vector, which is L plus V divided by its norm. Right? So if you think about, uh, let's see here. Here's the light, here's the camera, then L plus V divided by its norm is kind of like that. And, and it uses this into the rendering equation. Why did Blin and Torrance guess that this halfway vector had anything to do with shading is actually unclear to me. Um, it's been quite a long time trying to philosophize about this this morning, and I really didn't come up with a good answer. Um, yeah, somehow it's like kind of a muted version of the question. I don't know. If somebody has a good explanation, I'll take it. But in any event, um, if you compare the lobe that you get, um, this actually kind of makes it a little bit pointier. You can see that, that it kind of touches the surface a little bit more closely, um, which is kind of trying to model uh, this, this Fresnel effect. And in fact, even if Blin and Torrance, I believe when you read that paper, they just kind of say, we propose a model for shading, and here's the formula, and when we implement it, our materials look better. Like, I, I don't think that they do a ton of physics. Um, in 2005, um, uh, people actually went back and, and, and measured and, and found that actually this is a much better fit uh, 
uh, for uh, data that we actually get from gonadal reflectometers. In fact, you may recognize two of the names on this paper are the other two graphics faculty, sorry, I'm the third guy, uh, and then our EECS yeah. um, Right. So as one kind of final concluding thing to talk about today, um, we're going to talk a tiny, tiny bit about microfacet theory, which is um, essentially the, sort of the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to defining really complicated BRDS and how people go about reasoning about them. We're not going to actually derive any formulas here, but just kind of understand the effects of, of, of what goes into a BRDF calculation if you really want to do it correctly for a given material. And the basic idea and the basic theory that goes into understanding why BRDFs exist um, is that, like, you know, the physics of materials isn't that complicated at a micro scale, right? Like, they really are like little mirrors that are, that are reflecting light around them. But what is complicated is actually the geometry of the surface, right? That if I zoom in really, really, really close to a surface, um, eventually uh, it's like a bunch of tiny mirrors that are all rotated from one another. Yeah? And so the, the, the bright pixels are somehow aligned to the reflection angles. Um, but there are a lot of different things that can damage the amount of light that you can see, right? One is the cosine law, uh, but another uh, is actually occlusion. Right? So if I have a really rough surface and I view it from the side, then actually the surface itself is blocking some of the light from reaching my eye, because right? it goes in there. Um, and so this is the beginning of this idea of, of microfacet theory, which dates um, all the way back to the 1960s. The idea is that if I took a magnifying glass to, to, to even a nice, good-looking surface, eventually it's going to look something like the picture down here. Yeah? And so the value of the birya, um, you know, well, what do I do? I choose some incoming light direction. Now the light direction and the viewer direction are basically constant because I'm so close to my surface that they're not changing. Um, and what I want to do is kind of figure out statistically how many mirrors are exactly halfway between L and V. Right? Because remember that a mirror that's halfway between L and V is going to be the one that reflects the light outward that way. Right? And so what I want to figure out is kind of, if I randomly drew a point in this little neighborhood on the surface, what is the probability that I get a mirror that kind of redirects light in this direction? And that's really what the mirror you have to try to measure in this microfacet theory. It's kind of a cool theory to think about, right? So this is the, the, the kind of picture that they have, right? Is that you're trying to figure out how many surfaces are oriented to the spectrum H, which is L plus B divided by 2, which now you can see where maybe Plato uh, Torrance uh, came from. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I identify all the different things that are kind of aligned to that H, uh, and, and, and that's going to be the value of my beard yeah. um, But uh, one kind of annoying factor gets in the way, which is take a look at this little micro facet. Right? So he really is reflecting stuff in the V direction here. But you actually, if your viewer is somewhere over here, they actually don't see the light that gets contributed from this micro facet because it's occluded by this green signal. You can see how these calculations are going to get really complicated. Because these are all happening statistically, right? It's not like they're going to make a 3D model of a rough surface and actually measure this stuff. But instead, they're going to say, well, this is sort of the spatial variation, and this is the steepness. And now we're going to see, on average, how many of these facets can I see. Right? And so, so this uh, is sort of one, one way to measure it now. This is for Nell coefficient. Uh, and, and right. So, so that's a, sort of the basic uh, statistics that you want to do. Right? You're trying to figure out what fraction of mirrors are pointed in the way that, 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 that send the light in the proper direction, and then I want to dampen that by the fraction of those mirrors that are, are occluded by other mirrors. Yeah? Uh, and there's many, many uh, BRDF models out there that, that, that kind of look like this. So we've, we've included a bunch of links in the slides. Um, and, and typically what people do uh, is they make a probability distribution over the normals to the surface. This is a weird thing to think about. So the idea is that at a given point on the surface, the normal vector doesn't just point perpendicular to the surface. There's actually a little probability distribution over the unit sphere, which is saying where that micro facet is pointing. And then they use integrals against that thing um, to define a BRDF. Okay? In fact, um, so the, the full-on cook torrance lobe actually tries to account for all of this stuff. So you have a specular coefficient, a micro facet distribution, um, uh, which includes the angle between the half vector and the roughness of the surface, shadowing, masking, and, and diffuse stuff. At the end of the day, even, even if we're not going to define this equation in class, once again, is implementing this thing so painful? Not really, right? It just takes a bunch of vectors in. You have to be very careful how you type it. It's 
Uh, and, and, and so the idea, all, all I'm trying to communicate here is that um, BRDS, even just to capture just a rough but, but kind of globally smooth surface, you know, which is a pretty common scenario to be in, uh, get pretty complicated um, and, and really do add some, some interesting effects. In fact, a fun paper to look at uh, tries to make designer BRDS. Right, so for instance, maybe I shine a light on a surface and I want to see a star get reflected off. You can imagine that you could actually engineer a surface that does this, right? Like, you could, if you were really, really careful with a toothbrush and a piece of metal, uh, had a lot of time on your hands, you could engineer, you know, a very particular brushed metal to have that effect, at least at that one point. Um, is it likely that you encounter these surfaces in everyday life? No, but there are all kinds of crazy materials out there, and for every kind of example, somebody finds one. Right. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so there are all kinds of different examples here. Here's uh, some other ones. So here's uh, a dark blue paint uh, material. So here is a pretty common way to visualize the light in a scene. I place a little sphere that just reflects on the back of the camera. And so here, now I've replaced that sphere with some shiny object. Right? So really what you're seeing, if this is like a really boring BRDF that just bounces stuff off, this is now showing you where the material is coming. Right? Um, so this is, I, uh, this is actually a photograph. This is acquired material. Um, if I try to find the kind of best fits blend phone, let me turn off the lights. Um, essentially what you see is that the best fit is not a particularly good fit for your data, right? If you're taking a machine learning class and you look at this image, you would say this is not a very good, there aren't enough parameters in this BRDF. I've underfit the information that I have about this sphere. Yeah? Um, and by the way, this is like not an interesting, I think they just like went to Sherman Williams and, and, and painted this sphere. Like this is a, exciting object. Yeah? Um, if you find the best fit Cook Torrance, you can see that it's actually remarkably close to this, this diffuse object. Um, there are some crazy objects for which uh, even Cook Torrance is not particularly effective. Um, these are easy to find on Christmas uh, because they look uh, something like this. Um, so these kinds of brushed metal plasticky things that are like a little diffuse and a little reflective um, are quite challenging. I think what's going on in this material, if I recall, is that there's kind of a metal ball and then it's surrounded by like kind of cloudy plastic and so there's like all kinds of reflectance going on there right there's reflections of the plastic there reflects the metal ball and the kind of diffuse aspect of the, the, the cloudy material um, so one thing you can do is just add together two different contorance models uh, and in this case they show that this is a pretty reasonable uh, way to capture that of the scene yeah uh, so, so here the acquired data is on the left and the cooked torrents is on the right and you can see the it kind of sharpens things, presumably because it can't capture those two layers. Um, if I add two uh, cook torrents, right, so it's kind of like a mixture of Gaussians instead of a Gaussian if you're doing statistics class, then I get this pretty close fit here. So you can see that even though we're talking about rendering, actually the themes here look an awful lot like statistics and machine learning, right? You have some data, which is the samples of your BRDF, and your job is to fit it as well as possible. Yeah? It's just that the function that we use to fit aren't like SVMs, but rather they're these very kind of specific BRDF that, that, that model uh, physics. There are all kinds of different things people do. Um, one of the big uh, research topics that people study quite a bit is image-based acquisition. Right, so the idea would be I take a photo of Larry, and that's the only data I have. I don't have his geometry, I don't have him from another camera angle, I don't have him under another light. How well can I do estimating his BRDF? And the answer is actually reasonably, right? Because in a single photograph of, of, of a person or an object, you actually see a pretty wide variety of, of, of viewpoints and, 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 and normal directions and pairs of normal direction and lighting direction. Um, so especially if you can kind of guess a little bit about the 3D geometry of your scene, it's reasonable to, to have kind of a scattered collection of, of BRDF samples from that. And of course there are all kinds of things that go crazy. So um, here's one of these papers where they actually tried to fabricate a surface with a very particular uh, reflectance uh, function. Any questions before we move on to our last little five minute topic? Cool. Okay, um, one additional thing which I think typically gets thrown in the Fong model, although I usually think about Fong as a shading technique, um, is, is, is the idea of, of the normal vector itself. So remember that a triangle mesh is piecewise flat, right? It is consistent of a bunch of little flat triangles. Yeah? And if I render it um, as piecewise flat, object, then I'll get renderings that look like the thing on the left-hand side, right? Like you'll actually see the facets of the triangle mesh. That makes sense. And in a sense, physically, that's what you would expect, right? I mean, it's made up of a bunch of flat triangles, so if you render it 
play a bunch of flat triangles, and you'll see them. Yeah? But of course, our eyes are, are very sensitive to um, these sorts of, of, of C0 changes. And, and so one typical thing to do uh, is to interpolate the normal vector along the surface of a triangle. Right, and then use that for your dot product uh, calculation. Even though notice that that's a little bit false, right? I mean, we can see here that like this thing is not actually normal to this flat facet, right? And that doesn't matter. It's just for purposes of work. Yeah. Um, and that creates uh, these kinds of things where you can kind of see the edges of this mesh because this is a very coarse mesh, um, but obviously, it, but it's still it's loosely it's not quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and this is a pretty typical trick. Uh, and then finally, uh, where uh, we're going to leave off for today, is that of course the materials we see in everyday life are not the teapot on the left hand side, but maybe the teapot in the middle, plus or minus this kind of psychedelic cup plus teapot combo here. Um, but the, 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 the material actually varies as, as a function of space. Right? And if you think about the way that our rendering pipeline works, that's actually going to be fine. Right? Because I can store, for example, a texture along my surface that, that maybe keeps the, the, the diffuse and specular coefficients in the phone model. Right? And then what happens when I render my surface? Well, I see that my ray hits a particular point. <laughs> I figure out the coefficients of the phone model at that point, and then I evaluate the light. And so there's really nothing about that calculation that needs it to be spatially constant. Uh, and so that's the way we're going to simulate really interesting materials. So for instance, here maybe they used you know, shiny that you know, shiny paint for the white stuff, and then like lead to paint the, the blue stuff. Hopefully not on a teapot, uh, and, 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 and then uh, that way you have two different materials that you can see in a very detailed fashion. Of course, doing that is going to require storing a texture map, which is what we'll talk about next time. So with that, uh, we're done for the day. I encourage you all to stare at these images and figure out which one is rendered and which one is not. These are from the matrix, uh, and I will see you uh, on Thursday. And we can turn on the lights so you can get out of here. <laughs>